Greetings, and welcome to another academic half day. Today, I'm going to talk to you about malaria. Now, malaria is a, an incredibly important infectious disease that affects a wide variety of people around the world. Currently, about 108 countries uh, that encompass a total of 3 billion uh, people on the planet are, have malaria as endemic in the, in the population. This translates into about 216 million uh, cases per year and about 655,000 deaths, um, at least in 2010 alone, just from malaria. And unfortunately, most of these deaths occur in young children less than five years of age. So I think it's important, especially as, uh, as the world becomes flatter, that critical care physicians appreciate and understand the basics of malaria, especially if you work in a Western world where you may not have been exposed to it, but now because of air travel and, uh, and much more frequent um, uh, um, uh, immigration, uh, you're going to likely see cases of malaria in, in the course of your careers. So before we get too far into the actual clinical features, First, we should understand some of the epidemiology of the, uh, of the infection. Now, the transmission intensity is determined largely by the density of the mosquitoes uh, in the area, as well as the habit of those individual mosquitoes. For, for, for some species of, uh, of mosquitoes, they prefer not to bite uh, throughout the course of the day or at night and tend to limit their feeding to the dusk and dawn times. And so that that changes some of the distribution and the uh, and the types of infections in their presentation, as well the efficiency of the biting, as well as any control mechanisms that are in place to try to co uh, control the mosquito population, uh, can have an influence on the transmission intensity. Transmission intensity is important because in areas where transmission is low, which generally refers to about one infectious bite per year, um, which is typical in the Asia, uh, uh, Central Asia, uh, sorry, Asia, Central America, and South America, um, the, the pattern of diseases is significantly different. Uh, higher areas of transmission occur in the Sub-Saharan region in Africa, and they can have over a thousand uh, uh, infectious bites uh, in a year. When you see a, a pattern of year-round transmission of infections, uh, this is called this year-round uh, infection uh, is called a stable transmission, whereas an unstable transmission occurs when there's uh, seasonal uh, infections, uh, such that it takes a longer period of time for people to develop some form of immunity against the uh, against the parasite. Uh, or may not occur at all, and in which cases then you may actually see disease at, uh, at all ages. Um, typically in areas where there's a stable transmission with high burden of, trans of, uh, of infection, uh, some form of immunity has already started to develop by the time uh, somebody's over the age of five. Now in areas where there's unstable transmission, environmental changes such as changing weather patterns, uh, war, uh, deforestation can change uh, an unstable, uh, um, can change the pattern of infections and can lead to an epidemic. The overall, the world distribution of, of malaria, you can see in this graph here, and you can see that with the exception of North America uh, and Russia and Europe, as well as Australia and, and portions of, Central, of uh, South America, that malaria is pretty well endemic uh, in the rest of the world. Okay, so next we should talk about the biology and the life cycle of the plasmodium infection. And for the vast majority of this talk, I'm going to be referring almost exclusively to plasmodium uh, infections, as those are the ones that cause the most severe infections in, uh, uh, in people. Uh, the plasmodium life cycle, as you can see from this graph, uh, follows through a number of different stages that involve both the mosquito as a host and also the human as a host. The cycle begins when sporozytes uh, infect the liver. These are injected from the saliva, saliva of the mosquitoes uh, into the blood. They make their way into the liver and then once they're in the hepatocytes they begin to multiply over the course of about a week into uh, merozoites. Um, these merozoites eventually, uh, as they reach capacity within the hepatocytes, burst out and then start invading uh, red blood cells um, and will go through this continuous cycle of, 
of, uh, of replication consumption of the uh, red cell product uh, uh, contents uh, and then bursting out of the red cells to go on to reinfect uh, other, uh, other red blood cells. Interestingly, the, not only will the parasite uh, consume all the cellular contents, including all of the hemoglobin, um, but it will also insert its own parasite proteins uh, into the cell membrane of the, of the red blood cells in order to uh, take up nutrients. Over time, some of these uh, mirocytes uh, develop into gametocytes uh, and then circulate throughout the, through, within the blood uh, and then are available to be taken up uh, by another mosquito. The, the, the gametocytes then make their way into the gut of the mosquito and from the gut of the mosquito will combine and form um, a, a zygote which will then form more sporozytes which make their way into the salivary glands for the mosquito and onwards and the cycle begins all over again. So it, malaria has been a problem uh, in the world for millennia basically and malaria itself has had a profound effect on the human genome. Uh, there are a variety of different genetic, what we would consider genetic disorders, which are actually protective uh, against, uh, uh, against the development of uh, overt infection and death from malaria. Uh, most, most importantly, most, as most of you should know, uh, the sickle cell trait, uh, hemoglobin S, uh, is protective against uh, the development of uh, malarial infections. And so when individuals are heterozygous for hemoglobin S, they are uh, protected, uh, relatively protected against infection. But then obviously when they are homozygous for hemoglobin S, they develop sickle cell disease. And typically in a world where there was no health care, uh, typically died at a young age. Hemoglobin, other hemoglobins, though, also uh, provide some level of protection against uh, malarial infection. Hemoglobin C and E both uh, are able to decrease the uh, parasitic uh, growth rate by, uh, by producing a low oxygen tension uh, uh, environment. As well, the, the cells themselves uh, also have a reduced ability for cytoadherence, which is important as part of the pathogenesis of malarial infections. Um, and also the, the, uh, the uh, difference in uh, the hemoglobin molecules also reduces their ability to, uh, the, 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 uh, the parasite's ability to multiply at a higher, to higher densities. Another, uh, another hemoglobinopathy um, or red cell disorder that we, that we commonly consider uh, pathological but is actually protective in malaria is ovocyst uh, ovocytosis. Uh, and in those cases, those, those particular cells have an, an increased resistance to invasion from the parasite. And so the cells can't be, uh, are, are not as easily victimized by this. Uh, as well, the uh, G6PD uh, deficiency, which uh, again, we also consider to be a significant problem, especially when we're using uh, a variety of medications. Uh, has the uh, has a protective effect in malaria as it reduces the uh, parasite density inside the cells. Now, as I sort somewhat alluded to a little bit earlier, there is actually an immunity that develops uh, in people in repeated exposure to malaria. Now, the parasite itself is a very complex organism, and there's an awful lot of antigenic uh, variation because there is meiosis um, and uh, um, uh, chromosome swapping that occurs in the uh, in the uh, 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 mosquito uh, during uh, during after uh, to form the zygotes, so it takes a significantly longer period of time and numerous exposures for the body to become um, properly immunized against uh, uh, against uh, the malaria. Now, the um, Immunity itself is immunity to illness, but not to infection. Obviously, the cells once they uh, um, once they get into the they once you're in, once you've had parasites injected into you, they're often hard to clear from the system. But the immunity itself can help dampen down the response and also help keep the infection at bay, so that some people can actually develop an asymptomatic parasitemia, especially in higher uh, transmission zones. The, the immunity itself is at first nonspecific because, uh, because of the absence of uh, uh, antigen recognition. But over time, both humoral and uh, cellular immunity systems 
uh, kick in to develop resistance to the infection um, and, uh, and then play a much more uh, important role as the, um, as the parasite goes through its life cycles. As a general rule, when um, people live in high transmission areas, they generally develop a uh, immunity to malaria by the time they're age five, assuming that they've survived um, and can um, carry on uh, with uh, repeated exposures and repeated infections that don't actually cause them any, any symptoms um, later on into their life. Areas where there's a lower transmission rate uh, are the areas where people can become sick with malaria even at, into adulthood. And so have, um, uh, so when people come from the, these regions, um, they can become, even if they're living in an endemic region, they can present to your hospital with, uh, with uh, overt infection and uh, severe symptoms. So the clinical features are important to recognize, um, especially in anybody who has a travel history to areas where malaria is endemic. Um, if they're native to the region, then they may present with asymptomatic infection uh, if there's a higher transmission rate. Um, and so in those cases, they may actually, you may actually find malarial parasites, but they're not actually the cause of the patient's problems. And we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in just a, in just a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> But when people who are living in low transmission areas come to uh, present a, to, uh, to, to you, uh, you need to uh, consider the possibility that they're infected as well as also individuals who have traveled to endemic regions regardless of their, uh, whether it's a high or low transmission site um, because obviously they're not ex they've not been constantly exposed. The vast majority of people present with symptoms that are very nonspecific, fever, fatigue, headaches, you know, things that, that, you, that make it very hard to differentiate. It's very important that you get a, a travel history to help um, identify malaria as a possible cause in the, uh, for, that, for, the, for these people. Uh, traditionally, we, we expect a cyclic fever, and this cyclic fever in plasmodium infections usually coincides with the uh, red cell uh, lysis that occurs at about every 48 hour interval so that the patient themselves should be describing fevers and chills that occur in a cyclic nature. Um, and in my experience, the vast majority of people who have presented to hospital have either um, have had a history of cyclic fevers, uh, have not noticed that they've actually been having cyclic fevers, or have had almost continuous fevers um, right from the get-go. But fever is certainly an important part of the um, um, part of the symptomatology. If the infection, if the malarial infection is severe, they can develop cerebral symptoms, including seizures and comas. And then on physical examination, you can find um, the presence of a palpable spleen. Um, and in children, they can actually develop hepatomegaly uh, as well, um, coinciding with uh, with a palpable spleen. spleen. The spleen is a, an important uh, organ in malarial infections, as it is the source where uh, all of the uh, parasitized and, uh, and damaged red cells are cleared from the system and so the, the spleen necessarily becomes enlarged. Um, hepatomegaly in the children usually occurs again because again in, especially in an acute infection it's the first stop for the malarial parasites um, and they can, they can develop an inflammation from that. Adults on the other hand don't generally develop hepatomegaly but they'll often have a mild jaundice associated with, uh, with acute infection. Once people get into a, a stage where they're getting recurrent disease, they usually present with more of a chronic anemia um, and the splenomegaly that goes along with it. Um, when you see somebody, when you see a kid with uh, with severe malaria, they may present with uh, with uh, severe anemia as well as hypoglycemia, which is much more common in kids and something you have to really watch out for. But in severe malaria in adults, they typically will present with pulmonary edema, acute kidney injury, and then jaundice, which is, and, uh, and these are far more common uh, for, um, uh, for adults to present with. So understanding the pathogenesis of, of the malaria infection is important because while understanding the life cycle gives you good insight into some of the clinical features um, and the symptomatology, a really deep understanding of the pathogenesis of malarial infections will actually help you really understand why severe malaria is different and how that occurs um, and help you better understand the disease in total. 
the uh, interesting thing about, uh, about malarial infections is once they uh, infect red blood cells, the red blood cells then begin to extrude a high molecular weight of uh, adhesion proteins. Now these adhesion proteins are responsible for mediating cytoadhesion um, out to the endothelium and particularly interact well with the uh, ICAM-1 molecule on the endothelium. So what you end up getting then is uh, infected red blood cells that tend to stick to the walls of the microcirculation. This is a um, uh, this is a way of trying to get these sequ sequester these cells so that they can then be identified by the spleen, taken up and uh, and cleared. Um, but it also benefits the parasite in that it allows it, it by sequestering to the microcirculation. Um, it keeps the uh, uh, it keeps the parasites uh, out of the direct exposure of the the rest of the immune system, but this sequestration of mat uh, mature parasites um, will tend to occur where there's areas of high density of uh, microcirculation, so in areas of vital tissue basically, and this has significant impact on the overall blood flow. At the same time, the red, uninfected red cells um, also because, uh, become, uh, become less deformable. And even though they're not infected themselves, they can further exacerbate microcirculatory ischemia um, and, also, uh, and also can cause uh, occlusions uh, if, of themselves. The host response is also augmented, and so the splenic clearance of, uh, of infected and uninfected cells is increased, leading to the, a lot of the anemia that you'll see uh, in this patient population. So severe malaria is the, on one end of the spectrum of infection, um, is marked by a much more extensive sequestration of red cells um, and further end organ dysfunction. And the end organ dysfunction is really what marks the difference between um, uh, a malarial infection and severe uh, malaria. The most uh, concerning uh, complication of malaria is cerebral malaria. There's uh, little evidence of uh, inflammation, increased ICP or cerebral edema uh, in this, uh, in this uh, disease process. And these patients present with coma and seizures and we're not entirely certain of the underlying etiology of this. There doesn't seem to be any changes in the brain matter itself. Um, nor, as I've pointed out, any changes in the uh, water content or the ICP. There is, however, appears to be some disruption of the axoplasmic transport uh, and the attachment of red cell fragments uh, and malarial proteins to the axons uh, is believed to be at least in part due to the, uh, uh, the cause for the uh, symptoms that occur uh, in cerebral malaria. Obviously, if you have a, a large, if you have a heavy burden of parasites, um, and you have a spleen that's that's uh, very active and and trying to clear the the infection, you can develop a very severe anemia. Um, now, combine the the problem of uh, accelerated splenic removal of of uninfected uh, red cells because they're slightly deform non deformable, and red cells that are non deformable. Um, to the spleen are read as being old and time to be cleared out, and so they get taken out of this out of circulation as well, as well as enhanced just removal of the uh, um, of the infected red cells, combined with the fact that these that a large chunk of the red cells are being destroyed by the uh, by the lysis of the uh, malarial parasites as they go through their life cycles, um, and you combine this with ineffective erythropoiesis, which occurs in chronic inflammation inflammatory diseases, and you have a setup for severe anemia in uh, in um, in patients with severe malaria. If you have a, a lot of microcirculatory uh, obstruction and ischemia, you can obviously expect to see a significant amount of acidosis that occurs uh, con uh, concurrent with that. Tissue ischemia um, and microcirculatory ischemia is certainly to blame, and lactic acidosis is a, an ominous finding in people who have severe malaria. But at the same time, there's also a relatively higher amount of lactate being produced because of the malaria par parasites as well. And as you see higher levels of uh, lactate production, and if it's coming from the malaria, well, and obviously there's a higher burden of uh, malaria that is uh, causing that can make you quite sick. The children, as I pointed out, have a problem with. Uh, um, hypoglycemia, and this is usually due to a failure of hepatic uh, gluconeogenesis, uh, which occurs not only during the initial infection and the hepatis, hepatic phase of the uh, uh, of the infection, but also as uh, as part and parcel of uh, 
of the overall infection. Uh, children themselves are, are much more prone to hypoglycemia, um, not having a lot of the uh, d um, body stores that, uh, that adults have. As you can well predict, the other con consequences of severe inflammatory diseases includes things like pulmonary edema, which is believed to lead to an acute lung injury, and as well, people with, uh, with um, a severe malaria can develop an acute uh, uh, kidney injury. And it's, although the exact pathogenesis is unclear, it's believed that uh, it's behaving much like an ATN and is probably just a, a side victim of the actual in uh, malarial infection itself. So malarial infections, interestingly, can also lead to um, other infections. Uh, and in severe malaria, about 5 to 8 percent of people will also present with an enteric bacteremia. This bacteremia is believed to be due to translocation of enteric um, uh, bacteria, and is uh, and the underlying thought, uh, the the underlying cause is believed to be that the, the um, malaria pigments, which is the uh, uh, the byproduct of malarial. Uh, consumption of the um, hemoglobin molecules um, when they're ex when they're uh, excreted um, either from lysis uh, lysis of the red cells can tend to take up a lot of the red the white blood cells time and these PMNs uh, run around gobbling up all of these uh, malarial pigments and it leaves them exhausted and full and basically leaving defenses down to allow for enteric invasion to occur so one of the first walls of defense get taken down. But when people present with malaria, you also have to be very suspicious for other things that could be uh, either happening coinciding or you could actually be missing a diagnosis. Um, as I've pointed out, people, uh, there's a significant number of people who will actually present with asymptomatic malarial infection. So it's a coincidence that they actually uh, have that, but they were actually sick with something else. So things like pneumonia, sepsis, and meningitis can be frequently missed, especially in areas where diagnostic uh, uh, equipment is not as readily available. And so you have to be careful, be mindful of the patient who presents with what could potentially be an asymptomatic infection that coincides with the actual cause and not to be uh, not to get your blinders on about other causes, uh, or not to be not to be blinded to uh, other potential uh, things that could be making the patient sick, um, and being distracted by the malarial infection, which is actually not causing them a problem. And then, obviously, individuals who are HIV and AIDS um, are at significant risk for increased severity of malarial infections, as well as mortality uh, from the development of severe malaria. And unfortunately, in areas of of high transmission is also uh, in areas of high transmission of HIV. Um, and so the concurrence of these diseases uh, leads to a significant, uh, ex significantly higher levels of mortality and morbidity. So how do we make the diagnosis? Well, the, di the gold standard for diagnosis has always been the uh, thick and thin uh, prep and looking at the actual peripheral blood smear under a microscope and seeing the parasites. And as you can see here, those wee beasties hanging out inside those red cells, the diagnosis is usually fairly easy to make. However, you need to be cautious in people who have cleared their, um, uh, partially cleared their, their peripheral blood, especially if they've been taking anti-malarials, um, may actually have a negative smear um, and you may not actually get to see the organism while they're actually still infected with the uh, sequestered, uh, um, uh, uh, sequestered red cells uh, in the, in the uh, microcirculation. The benefit of having a, doing a thin and thick prep is it allows you to also quantify the actual level of parasitemia and so you can actually give you a sense of uh, percentage of, of red cells that are infected, um, which gives you a level of severity of the, uh, of the disease. More recently, there have been uh, a number of rapid assays uh, using antibodies to try to uh, uh, um, easily identify and quantify the, um, uh, the presence of an infection. Um, one of the more recently developed involves uh, detecting the uh, PFR, uh, PFHRP2 antigen, uh, which uh, has been found to be as good as microscopy in making a rapid diagnosis for a malarial infection. However, the, the uh, test itself can be positive for several weeks, uh, even after the acute infection has, uh, has been cleared. The benefit to this test, however, is not only the speed with which it can be done, it just needs a single drop of blood from a, um, uh, from a fingertip to make the diagnosis, um, but it also allows you to diagnose infections in people who may have already 
been taking antimalarials and have cleared their peripheral uh, parasitemia while still yet leaving some of the um, uh, sequestered red cells uh, infected and uh, ready to continue the cycle of life again. And so it allows you to identify those people. Now you're thinking to yourself, well, how on earth would somebody, why on earth would you get that kind of a scenario? Well, don't forget in, uh, in a lot of third world nations, uh, antimalarials are available either over the counter um, or on a black market. Um, and people who become infected, um, become sick, may start taking these things without seeking any medical help. Um, or alternatively, if you have a traveler who's been uh, not so much compliant with their medications, um, goes to a uh, goes goes gets infected, um, has their bottle of quinine. Finally, decides as they're coming home that they're not feeling very well. Starts taking the uh, their antimalarials. Well, they're not going to hear. You may end up having them uh, inadvertently missing the diagnosis if they clear their uh, peripheral blood uh, bloodstream. Um, and you do a smear and not do any rapid uh, assays. So the benefit of, uh, so, so the combination of these two tests is, uh, is diagnostic. Um, and certainly um, there will be a, a variety of different, uh, uh, more rapid immune assays uh, developed in the near future as uh, work continues to try to identify ways of, uh, um, of, of um, uh, fighting this disease. So in many respects, treatment for malaria has become much simpler in the, uh, over the number of years. Um, in the past, there were a variety of different antimalarials on the market, uh, and you had to choose it based on the uh, type of malarial infection that they actually had, whether it was uh, plasmodium uh, falciparum or if it was a vivox or, you know, you had to actually choose, uh, choose your medication carefully because resistance was different in different populations and different species. Um, a lot of that has fallen by the wayside, and now, and if you're pardon my uh, my problems with pronunciation, uh, artresinate uh, is uh, the drug of choice, first line therapy for uh, treatment of uh, of malaria. This is usually in severe malaria is given as an uh, as an IV, um, but there is an oral formulation uh, available, and it's given as 2.4 uh, mil, uh, milligrams per kilogram IV um, at first, and then repeat at 12 hours, and then again 24 hours later, um, and then you can repeat on a daily basis as necessary depending on the patient's um, uh, condition. Uh, quinine is still an option for malaria, uh, and it can be used if uh, atrocinate is not available. Um, there isn't. Uh, there is still low levels of resistance to atrocinate in the uh, throughout the world, but obviously a concern is the development of resistance to uh, antimalarials uh, worldwide. And then obviously critical care support for any end organ dysfunctions that may be occurring, including airway support if they have a coma. Uh, CRRT is still uh, still um, uh, a valid treatment for people even when they have bloodstream infection in these cases. Um, support of uh, mechanical ventilation for acute lung injury, um, and then transfusions as necessary uh, to support cardiac output and, and uh, organ perfusion, and all of the usual stuff that we do in critical care on a regular basis. So there are many different um, um, avenues to, to try to decrease the overall worldwide burden of uh, malaria. In fact, to try to eradicate malaria would be the ultimate goal. and. The person, one of the people who's uh, made it one of their life's work to try to get the uh, uh, malaria uh, eradicated is the inventor of the Microsoft Office and the machine you're probably watching on this now. Bill Gates and the Bill Gates Foundation are um, worldwide leaders in helping to eradicate malaria. There are a variety of different avenues that are being pursued in order to try to pre uh, try to prevent the disease and also eradicate it. Immunization obviously is the goals, uh, is the uh, uh, the ultimate goal. There are currently a number of different vaccines that are in the uh, in the works um, that are trying to um, to try to prevent the actual infection of uh, of malaria. But unfortunately, overall protection in these uh, in in populations that have uh, been tested is found to be relatively low in about the 30% uh, effectiveness range. Vector control is also important. If you can get rid of the mosquitoes, then you can essentially get rid of malaria. 
in areas of high transmission rates, uh, insecticide impregnated uh, um, mosquito nets has been shown to reduce all-cause mortality in children less than five, because remember, those are the ones that are most, most, uh, most uh, severely affected by malaria. Reducing, by using mosquito nets uh, that, that are insecticide impregnated can reduce their risk of mortality by 20%. Unfortunately, nets are less effective in areas where uh, mosquitoes are more active during the day, uh, during the uh, dusk and dawn periods when people are not usually in bed and not wearing, uh, not, and don't have mosquito nets on. Um, so other methods of vector control need to be, uh, need to be found. Using broad insecticide um, uh, spray pop uh, programs has found to have limited success um, because of the development of resistance in the mosquito population itself. As well, there's a widespread use of personal sprays, so off DD uh, type sprays to try to keep mosquitoes off you as a, individually, as well as people are doing inside, uh, in, indoors residual spraying where they spray the, uh, the household with a uh, lingering insecticide to keep mosquitoes populations under control. And these have also have uh, been effective to a degree, but again, have placed significant selective burden on uh, mosquitoes to, um, uh, to evolve and to become resistant to these uh, insecticides. So the battle continues on that front. Um, prophylaxis of malarial infections is recommended for all, tra all travelers to endemic areas. Um, and whatever, and I'm not gonna go into all of the different drug recommendations because largely, from a critical care point of view, we don't actually make those kind of recommendations. It's not really something you need to worry about. Um, but you need to understand that recommendations for prophylaxis will depend largely on where you're going and the pattern of susceptibility in that population. However, you should also know that prophylaxis is not completely reliable. And anytime somebody has uh, traveled to an area where malaria is endemic, malaria should be on the differential diagnosis uh, of anybody who presents with any kind of a febrile illness. Well, that's, uh, that's all there is I have to talk about for severe malaria. Um, thank you for watching. And if you have any comments, uh, please feel free to leave them in the comments section below on the, uh, in the uh, YouTube video uh, window. Um, as well, um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me if you, um, if, uh, if you have anything. And um, just in closing, I'd just like to show you the uh, uh, credits for the images that I've displayed, which were all available on uh, Wikimedia Commons. Uh, so all of them are freely available, but I would like to uh, attribute appropriately so that everybody knows uh, where, these, uh, where all my slides are coming from. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and we'll uh, we'll see you again later.